to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. This is our hour of power. Thank you for tuning in. And it is my prayer that you get something out of the worship service. Remember Pleasant Parishioners and Partners of PG. We also celebrate the lives of civil rights icons, uh, such as Reverend C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis uh, for uh, giving their lives uh, to the fight uh, for freedom and uh, civil justice. I pray that this worship is evoking to you. May God bless you. Enjoy Pleasant Green.
From day to day, as I walk, as I walk alone, this old narrow way, but since I Since he blessed this old soul of mine, it makes me want to run on and shout. Walk where 
Don't you know I'll always I'm gonna always be right Yeah I'm gonna cherish the race I'm gonna cherish this race I'm running, I'm running, I'm running Sisters, now it's time for the Word of God. We pray that this time not be mishandled and this time be enriching to you. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for this time that we share together. God, we thank you for uh, what you are doing even in the midst of this season. God, we pray uh, that you lead my mouth and that you lead my heart. Um, God, we pray that uh, you play me uh, as an instrument in any key that you see necessary and see fit for kingdom building. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, may we all say amen, amen, amen. Brothers and sisters, if you would go with me to the book of Matthew, go with me to the book of Matthew. If you didn't know where Matthew is or was, uh, it is the first book of 
the New Testament. Perhaps I know you all been at home for a long time. Perhaps you haven't picked up your Bible. And I may be assuming, and maybe you have, but I'm just saying, if you don't remember where Matthew is, let, allow me to tell you where Matthew is. Matthew is the first book of the Bible, and we want to share with you uh, in the 13th chapter, and we want to just read just a couple simple verses, 31 and 32. Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Now, your Bible may read just a little bit differently than mine. I'm reading from the New International Version, and there you will find words similar to these. This is what the reading of the word says, and he told them another parable. Right here, Jesus is preaching, and he's preaching using stories. He told them another parable, and this is what Jesus says. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in the field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds come and they can perch upon its branches. Brothers and sisters, I just want to use uh, as a title uh, participation in kingdom come. Participation in kingdom come. Brothers and sisters, in our previous quarter, we studied the Lord's Prayer. And one petition in the Lord's Prayer, in particular, that raised some interest is when Jesus said, Thy kingdom come. As we flesh through the lesson, we discover that the prayer for God's kingdom, kingdom to come is the hope and the ambition for God's righteousness to be made manifest in our culture. God's reign to be materialized uh, in our everyday living. God's reign to be materialized in our government uh, that it in turn would bring forth about equality in education, equal opportunity in health care, no disparages uh, in the criminal justice system, and a kingdom culture that would be civil for all citizens. Brothers and sisters, we must participate in helping the kingdom to come. Therefore, in this lesson and in this season of change and challenge as we face national and international dilemmas, as we face disease and discrimination, as we face killer bees and big hornets and giant bats, one of the questions that emerged for me is, what can I do within my own sphere of influence? What can I do within my own piece of the world? What can I do within my own context of ministry? What can I do in my own household? What can I do in my own piece of the world, within my own place, so that I can help bring God's kingdom to come? What can I do to participate in kingdom building? How can I help resist racism as one person? How can I challenge injustices? How 
can I comfort the bereaving? How can I enlighten the uninformed? How can I be an instrument of God to bring the kingdom to come so that we can be ensured that our meager existence makes a major impact? As we have paid attention to the text, we see that Jesus Christ emphasizes on small beginnings. Brothers and sisters, what the text is alluding to say is that uh, we can do small things to make big impacts. I want to say that one more time. We can do small things to make big impacts. And I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, don't ever, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, be ashamed of small beginnings. Because as we look at the text, he compares, Jesus compares the vast kingdom of God unto a miniature sized mustard seed. He compares the kingdom of God uh, something in our minds which is great and immense and he compares it to something as small as a mustard seed. And might I suggest to you today that God specializes in taking what we see as insignificant and augmenting it into something enormous. Let me say it one more time. God specializes in taking those things that we think are small and transforming it into a movement that changes the world. This particular passage, Jesus presents a parable that helps us to realize that our individual participation in bringing God's kingdom may seem small or insignificant in our own eyes, but the reality is that the impact that your participation makes is impactful on a great and grand scale. John F. Kennedy once said about engaging in the political process, he says, brothers and sisters, uh, that one person who fails to vote may impact uh, all of us on a democratic or not democratic on a democracy scale. Brothers and sisters, we've got to get to the point to where we understand that all of us have a role to play in building the kingdom and bringing the kingdom to come. God loves to start with what seems to be inconsequential and immerse himself in our efforts and affairs and produce really big results. There are over 31,000 verses and 100, uh, 1,189 1, chapters and 66 uh, books in the Bible which are filled with witnesses who can attest to the fact that God multiplies the minuscule. God makes big the things that we think are small. I wish that I just had just a few virtual praying folks in the house today. Uh, I know I got some witnesses in the biblical text. You all remember in Mark 6, where it was a little boy who had a snack pack of a Happy Meal, and in that snack pack of a Happy Meal, he fed 5,000 people. I want you to understand the things that you think are small, God can take them and he can turn them large. If y'all keep walking with me today, in 2 Kings, the 17th chapter, God took a hand wheel, a handful of fly, flour and a few ounces of oil in a jar and he changed it into a lifetime supply of lean cuisine. I wish I just had just one more witness in here. Can anybody give us a testimony that God does big things? 
things with small resources. You all remember 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, don't you? When Israel had a nine foot, nine inch tall problem, but God used a five foot tall solution. God took a young shepherd boy with only five smooth stones and a slingshot and he pitted him against that old brute, a veteran warrior. But even though this expert soldier had more militaristic experience, God gave the miniature boy the victory. And just like God gave the victory to David, God also can give you the victory on today. I wish I had some help in here in knowing that God is a God who shows you his omnipotent power when you are at your weakest. God tends to remind us of his omnipotent power by doing things that we could not have ever done or ever imagined could happen within our own power. You all remember that old song that the seasoned saints used to sing, don't you? They says that he, we, we are weak, but God is strong. But one of the things that, one of the caveats in this particular message is, brothers and sisters, that God, even though God will do things for you, even though God will make a way out of no way, even though God takes the small things that we have and makes them big, the, the caveat in this message is that you have to participate with God in order for God to bring you out. You've got to participate. You've got to participate. You have got to participate. Why don't you touch your neighbor in your household and say, you've got to participate with what God is trying to do in your life. God can take the most unlikely of events and turn it into a vessel that brings forth God's glory. But brothers and sisters, you've got to participate. This parable is also important because it shows that God, again, can take the most unpromising situation. If, if anybody came home uh, with a few seed, a few mustard seeds, brothers and sisters, you wouldn't think that you have much in your pocket. But I guarantee that if you planted those mustard seeds, then you will come out with a big situation. God can take the most unpromising situation and turn them into triumph and glory. As a matter of fact, the greatest event in the history of the world was the most greatly underestimated event in the history of eternality. You, you all remember when they hung our Lord up high and they stretched him out. Well, I, I don't want to go there yet, but there are a few things I want to share with you that emerge from the text. First of all, we see that this is a parable. A parable is not a, 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 a historical event, but a parable is a story that the author uses and tells. Usually Jesus uses parables. A parable, brothers and sisters, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So therefore, one of the things that I don't want you to miss about this text, first of all, that there is purpose in this parable. There is purpose in this story. My brothers and sisters, in the world of the text, uh, there was always talk about kingdoms. There were always talks about uh, a kingdom. There, in the text, there was always talk about kingdom. Kingdom or kingdomship was a language that Jesus' disciples were familiar with, but the problem that the disciples had is that their perspectives of the kingdom of God was different than Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, when Jesus taught about the kingdom, he had to address their secular point of view. You see, Jesus saw a divine kingdom, but the disciples were looking for an earthly administration. Let, let me run that by you again. Brothers and sisters, what Jesus saw coming into the world was a divine kingdom, but his disciples were looking for earthly administration. In other words, brothers and sisters, what Jesus saw is that everybody who heard his word and participated in kingdom building, brothers and sisters, he saw that as an opportunity for the kingdom to be built because people understood what righteousness was. But the disciples saw kingdom building as a king that would come and somehow and some way overthrow the Roman government. But what Jesus saw was different from what his disciples saw. So brothers and sisters, one of the purposes of this particular uh, parable is that Jesus came to readjust their perspectives so that they can begin to focus on what was necessary to build the kingdom of God. All I'm saying is, brothers and sisters, that God is coming also into our lives and we've got to get to the place where we hear God so that our uh, perspectives can be changed. Uh, the Lord, and I, I share this with you, brothers and sisters, don't miss what the Lord is trying to show you because you're only paying attention uh, to what you want to see. You see, kingdom uh, in the disciples' eyes had always meant greatness and glory. But brothers and sisters, what Jesus says, don't despise small beginnings. Sometimes the Lord in his teaching was sharing with them that there is a major thing to learn about a minor situation. That's why Jesus said that the greatest among you shall be what a servant. We've got to get to the place and the point where we understand that many times the Lord thinks differently than how we think. The people whom Jesus was ministering to wanted to think big about the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah to come in on a horse, but Jesus decided to come in on a donkey. The Lord, uh, brothers and sisters, saw things. Brothers and sisters, don't miss your purpose by maintaining an inaccurate perspective. There are so many of us who miss purpose because we are looking at the wrong thing. That's why we have to stay focused and not just stay focused, but brothers and sisters, it is important that we stay focused on the right thing. Isaiah already told us that God will keep us in perfect peace, those of us whose minds are stayed on thee. Isaiah told us that our minds are, will be kept if we stay uh, or we focus on Jesus. Nevertheless, we've got to understand that sometimes the Lord shows up in the most unlikely of places. Sometimes God shows up with an improbable role in our lives. Sometimes God shows up with an inconceivable resume. Sometimes God shows up, and when God shows up, there is an implausible ending. If I, I wish I had just a few more witnesses here, I'll ask Noah, Noah, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, Noah's folks uh, missed out on salvation and drowned because they saw a boat on dry land, but Noah saw a cruise line to cover and safety. Some folks will miss 
what God is trying to show them because they're looking at the wrong thing. Some folks pull a Candace Owens and miss emancipation because they were looking at Amaretta Ross and they saw an old woman with radical views and a shotgun, but Harriet Tubman had the right perspective and saw an underground railroad that led to freedom and liberation. Brothers and sisters, what I suggest to you on this morning, don't miss out on your purpose because you're focused on the wrong thing. Don't miss out on where you're supposed to go because you're looking in the wrong direction. You see, sometimes you can miss a God moment. You can miss a true purpose that God intends for you to be a part of because you are looking at things with the wrong perspective. Brothers and sisters, I'm just about done, but after we look at the purpose of the parable, we also want to pay attention to the potential of the parable. There is potential in this particular parable. The first clause uh, of uh, verse 31 it says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but then we look in this grammatical structure, we see a but, and a but is a conjunction. It changes the nature of the first clause. I wish I had some help in here. The second clause in verse 31 says, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of all shrubs and it becomes a tree that birds can come and perch on. What I'm persuaded that this parable is in pursuit of professing to us as pleasant parishioners and partners of PG today is this, and I want y'all to hear me if you don't hear anything else. This is what I want you to hear. Small faith, when buried in fertile soil, at some point will emerge with guaranteed reward and incalculable impact. Let, let me say it one more time so that we can all get it. Brothers and sisters, when we are in pursuit of what God wants, when we have small faith, when we have small faith, small faith when buried in fertile soil at some point will emerge with guaranteed reward and incalculable impact. When you take small faith, and God ain't telling you to have all the faith in the world, but he's saying if you just have a little faith, what he's saying is that you don't have to have great faith, but you got to have faith in a great God. Brothers and sisters, if you have faith, just a little bit of faith, it will uh, yield guaranteed reward and incalculable impact. Small faith means, brothers and sisters, that we trust God. Just like a mustard plant, it will at some point affect everything around it. Brothers and sisters, if you are like a mustard plant, you will affect everything around you. You will grow and you will enter the lives of everything around you. Brothers and sisters, perhaps you may be encouraging someone. Maybe you may affirm someone. Maybe you protect someone. Maybe you might counsel someone. But another uh, caveat of this particular parable is that you've got to endure the process of planting and the procedure of propagation. You've got to endure the process of being planted and the procedure of propagation. One of the peculiarities 
of agriculture is that in order for a seed to grow, there must be a certain set of developmental circumstances. In other words, brothers and sisters, in order for a seed to grow, it must be, it must be in an environment that is conducive for growth. And what I share with you, brothers and sisters, that this life for the believer is, no matter what happens, is conducive for growth. In nature, oftentimes what happens to a seed is that it falls to the ground, it gets covered in dirt, and many times it's covered in manure. And all of us know what manure is, and all of us know that manure is has an unpleasant smell, but one of the incredible things about uh, uh, being in bull stuff is that it helps plants to grow. The amazing thing about a seed is that it was designed to take the elements of its environment, the dirt, the manure, the dampness, the darkness, and no matter how unpleasant it is, and no matter how unpleasant the experience is, the seed can use the elements and the minerals in its environment and it will use it to grow. You've got to use the minerals of the mess that you're in to grow. I don't know who I'm talking to in virtual land. I don't know who you are, but there is someone who has faith but don't get discouraged because it seems like life seems to throw us down to the ground. It seems like we're tossed all the way into the manure by life's circumstance. We're covered in filth. But brothers and sisters, what I'm sharing with you is what this parable is speaking to me is sometimes you've got to go through some stuff in order for your faith to become tough. You've got to go through some manure. You've got to be in some unpleasant situations. But one of the things that I want to share with you is, brothers and sisters, sometimes you have to go through some stuff to help your faith grow tough. So the next time you experience something that is unpleasant in your life. Don't allow it to cause you to grow bitter, but let it cause you to grow better. Allow it to make you grow stronger. Allow it to make you grow wiser. Allow it to make you grow more purposeful. Allow it to make you grow more resolute. Allow it to make you grow more resolved, more resilient, more steadfast, more solid, more tenacious because brothers and sisters, you ought to be determined to grow through what you go through. Grow through what you go through. The next potentiality of this parable is this. Mature faith gives provision for other people. If you are strong in your faith, it will provide provisions for folks who don't have faith. If you all remember when Elijah was with that young woman who said, I, I, my welfare has run out, my, uh, my unemployment has run out, and I'm just taking these few sticks and I'm gathering just a little bit of meal and I'm gathering and I'm preparing it to die with me and my son. But Elijah says, wait, before you do that, I want to encourage you to trust in the Lord and first I want you to prepare for me and, and then uh, she says, uh, and then what Elijah says to her, that my God will supply for you. He exercised his faith in such a degree that it began to rub off 
on a widow woman who had no idea or even no uh, comprehension of who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, Jacob was. Brothers and sisters, she was a woman who uh, was Phoenician. She had no idea of what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. But what I share with you is that when you begin to practice your faith, when you begin to exercise your faith, your faith will rub off on those who are around you. Somebody may be saying, well, Reverend Letcher, you just had two verses. Where is that in the text? I'm glad you asked. Clause B of verse 31. It says, when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs, and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come make nests and branch, branches. We've got to understand that when we grow strong in our faith, when our faith is mature, our faith tends to help other people. I'm done now, brothers and sisters. I've enjoyed the time uh, that we share together. I've enjoyed being in your living room, on your tablet, on your, uh, uh, on whatever device you're watching from. But the last thing I want to share with you is that there is not only, brothers and sisters, there's not only a purpose in this parable. There's not only potential in the par parable, but there is also power and potency in this parable. If you are a person of the kingdom, then this parable should portray your personality to somewhat a degree. You've got to understand that this parable uh, is, you should be a reflection of this parable. Somebody may be saying, well, Reverend Letcher, what do you mean? This is what I mean. If you look closer at, at the mustard seed, the mustard seed does something else. If you look at the mustard seed, you'll understand that the mustard seed, it does two things. It provides flavor, and it also provides healing. It provides flavor. Most of us are familiar with table mustard, and mustard is a condiment that is offered across the United States. I know all of us like a good ballpark hot dog. You know, one of the best condiments that we can put on a hot dog is mustard, and mustard flavors what we eat. So what I'm sharing with you is, brothers and sisters, as believers, you've got to be uh, the flavor to wherever you're at. It's somewhat like when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. We've got to add flavor to this tasteless world. We've got to change the way the world sees us. And also, brothers and sisters, if you didn't know, as I, as I close, mustard also offers medicinal helps. I remember as a young boy, my grandmother would have all kinds of remedies for all kinds of hurts and all kinds of ailments. I remember one day uh, my stomach was hurting badly and I, I told my grandmother about my stomach ache and she said, hey, well, I got something that could help you. Go into uh, the refrigerator and grab your mustard. I don't know if you're a person that keeps mustard in the refrigerator or on the table, but she said go into the refrigerator, grab the mustard, and take a teaspoon of mustard, and eat the mustard, and your stomach will feel better. Within a few minutes after I did what Grandmama told me to do, my stomach felt better. And I share this with you, brothers and sisters, that ought to be our role in a hurting and hemorrhaging world. That we ought to be ones 
who offer help and healing to those who are hurt. Somebody may be saying, well, Reverend Letcher, that sounds good, but are there any scientific uh, helps for mustard? Yes, mustard helps speed up your metabolism. Mustard stimulates digestion. Mustard inhibits cancer cell growth. It decreases symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. It lowers high blood pressure. It soothes sore throats and bronchitis and pneumonia. It aids in helping reduce the severity of asthma. It helps into healing bee sting. Brothers and sisters, what does that mean for us in our walk of life today? Jesus said it like this, in the fourth chapter of Luke. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He's, an, he's anointed me to bring good news to the captive, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of us have a role. All of us must play uh, our role as mustard seeds. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this message has been helpful to you. Uh, the door, uh, the virtual door uh, of the church is open. Uh, you can join Pleasant Green um, by emailing us or reaching out to someone who you know who is a part of Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. Um, you can uh, email G.H. Pruitt. Uh, at gmail.com and within 48 hours someone will reach out to you um, within again within 48 hours god bless you god bless you god bless you we are thankful again for all of our guests who have logged on uh, we want you to continue to pray for not only pleasant green but for the ministries of the church uh, uh, the universal church across this city and across this nation. Also, brothers and sisters, we want to open up an opportunity for you to give. There are two ways for you to give. Uh, you can give uh, uh, by postage or you can give online. If you would like to give by postage, you can send a check or a money order to 1220 Reverend R.E.V. G.H. Pruitt Place, um, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113, or you can give online at www.pgmbcstl.org. You can give uh, either one of those ways, and brothers and sisters, we are just thankful for your faithfulness and your generosity. We, again, bless God for you, and we just want to offer a word of benediction as we close. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy to the only wise God our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever, may we all say, Amen.